Hi everyone and welcome to our final week's feedback for Food is Medicine. This week we've had 30,000 comments so we've been rushing to keep up with all your discussion mm -hmm. and we've really enjoyed listening to some of the discussions that have been going on as well. So what's been the hot topics this week Mel? Well there have been a number of hot topics with learners really enjoying the week and um, learning more about how to n understand whether nutrition information they read on the internet is correct. Yeah. So um, the videos around how nutrition information can end up as fact on the internet has been really popular and also the portion size video that's been yes. a big eye opener for a lot of people to remind everyone to take note of how much they're putting on their plates. Um, also, one thing that was interesting was the different nutrition guidelines from around the world. A lot of learners were saying how much they enjoyed looking at different nutrition recommendations from different countries and how basically they were all very similar. And mm. I suppose that's because they are, when they've been developed, they've all been based on the same worldwide body of evidence around nutrition, which is where every country has come up with a similar understanding of where the nutrition science is at. However, each guide does have their own cultural spin. So we're saying the grains group in Japan, rice is recommended a lot more, whereas in Australia, perhaps it's more wheat-based products. And another hot topic as well have been um, barriers to healthy eating. So yes. Helen, are there any there that you can well, um, talk about? Mm. Typically, the big barriers are people's um, lack of time. Um, we all lead busy lives and it's really hard to make healthier choices when we're so busy and also cost. Mm. So I guess some um, top tips there, you know, I know when I rush out the door in the morning and I haven't got my lunch packs, um, it's much harder to make healthier choices. Yeah. So I guess, you know, trying to plan ahead, but it can be very difficult, particularly for people with, um, with trying to pack up lots of school lunch boxes mm. with different things in them. Yeah. But um, that was been the main barrier that people have to, to making healthy choices. Mm. And there are also um, a number of surveys throughout the course that people yes. have filled out for us to really help us try and provide you all with better ways of learning about nutrition. So Helen, would you like to tell us about some of those surveys there? Yeah, so one of the <coughs> things that um, was very popular was to fill in our vending machine survey. And out of that one, we something like 1,500 people filled that one in. Um, the majority of people being women, so that was interesting. Very mm. few men actually took things from the vending machine. But the top drink from the vending machine was actually water followed by juice and smoothies so mm. that was probably fairly typical mm. in terms of what people would choose and also most people were actually picking from the vending machine in the evening so after eight o'clock at night mm. and that means that I uh, presumably people are doing the course late in the evening when they finish their dinner and they weren't mm. particularly hungry so mm. people made really healthy choices from the vending machine mm. so the top food coming out of it was almonds followed by sushi so those were the two mm. top things that people were choosing but what we know about people who do rely on vending machines is that if they're very hungry and people are eating at night, night time, people tend to choose the unhealthier options. Mm. So again, it comes back to that kind of planning ahead. If you're certainly if you're working at night, if you're a night shift worker, thinking about what sorts of things that you're going to take with you is important ra rather relying on the vending machine where you're more likely to pick up a cola or something yeah. late at night just to mm. keep yourself going. So those are a couple of top tips there. So that mm -hmm. was really great. In terms of the pregnancy survey, um, we had 60% of people saying, again, that if they were very tired or if they'd had poor sleep, they were less likely to be able to choose healthy food. So again, that ties in with the fact that sleep's important to be able to, in our lifestyle, to be able to sustain us and to help us make healthier choices. And that also the major reasons why people slept badly was they wanted to get up in the night yeah. um, to go to the toilet. And the, yeah. one of the key things then is not to turn the lights on. So you, know, you have to try and just make sure that you're in a very dim light rather than exposing yourself to bright light, which wakes you up again. So to try and remain um, in that sleepy state. And that's a, yeah. that's a very good thing. The other interesting thing about the pregnancy survey was where people were getting their information from. Yeah. And a lot of people relying on the internet for information there. 30% of people said that they got information about their diet and about their lifestyle from the internet but it wasn't a very trusted source so mm. that also came through on the social yeah. media survey. Yeah absolutely so and, um, quite a few hundred of you filled out the social media survey in week three helping us to identify where um, you learners are learning about nutrition information <clears throat> and 60% um, of learners said they use social media to talk about their health and one of the top areas that people talked about on social media was the health conditions that they're currently suffering and also newer areas of nutrition such as clean eating and detoxing as well. And so thank you very much for filling out this survey.
survey because it helps us as researchers to understand where you would like to learn nutrition information from. So it helps us to be able to provide that information in a, um, an easier way for you. And one of the things is it ta science takes a long time. Mm. So although that um, people thought, for instance, that the 5 and 2 diet or modified fasting actually had a reasonable evidence base, mm. we're only just about to start a study ourselves next year looking at this mm. in adolescents with significant obesity. And that will take us three years to do and probably another year for it to get out. Mm -hmm. um, so the science actually does lag behind mm. social media. There's a lot of stuff out there. You can just post it. Mm. It doesn't mean to say that it's actually evidence-based. So I think this makes it really hard for people mm. to actually understand you know what's actually evidence and what's not mm. and the length of time that science actually takes mm. so that's not a bad thing because it means that we can do good science but also the fact that things do change and I think that's something that we just have to accept that over time as we do more research and more studies that our evidence builds and that will lead to change over you know again um, changing recommendations that that we see over a, um, a number of years mm. and following on from speaking about intermittent fasting diets there was an activity in week three that we asked you to do in which at the beginning of week three we asked you to indicate which diets or which popular diets you thought had the most evidence behind them and then we asked you to do it again at the end of week two to see whether your views had changed um, in light of the information you'd learnt about um, where you receive your nutrition information from and how to understand whether it's correct. Now the responses from the group was that the Mediterranean diet yes. came out on top with over 90% of people indicating that they thought it was the diet with the most evidence behind it and number two was the low glycemic index um, eating pattern and that was the same in both um, options for filling out the survey at the beginning and the end of the week and it's great that um, these two options have been chosen by the majority of you because these are two diets that do have a strong body of evidence behind them, the Mediterranean diet especially. Now the Mediterranean diet, there's a lot of evidence in the literature base, especially around the prevention for chronic conditions and so, and it's a very varied diet with a lot mm. of different foods in there that have a lot of, um, well, sorry, that are rich in a lot of nutrients and so it's definitely an eating pattern that many people around the world can start to introduce into their daily eating habits. Mm. And so really we need to think about that in terms of um, food being prevention. So food mm -hmm. is medicine, not just in treatment of certain conditions, but certainly long term, you know, food isn't a drug. It needs to be um, uh, eaten over a number of time, a number mm -hmm. of years really to get the benefit of prevention. And what we eat now is going to impact on our health, but it's particularly important during pregnancy and also in young children to develop great eating habits. So they're going to have the best chance of using food as medicine in the prevention of some of those chron chronic long-term diseases that are so epidemic in our populations today. We also have another challenge in the, in the food world and that is how we are going to produce enough food to feed our population in a sustainable way and also at a cost that everyone can afford. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a really big area for the future and we need to be open to new ideas and new ways of doing things in terms of being able to achieve those objectives which is to make sure that everyone has a, a sufficient, safe and healthy food supply at a reasonable cost that they can actually manage to mm -hmm. afford and that's really a great big challenge for us particularly in public health nutrition. So today is our final day. Um, we're wrapping up today this course. We're hoping that you've really enjoyed it. We've certainly enjoyed putting it on. I'd like to thank my team here at Monash who are the most fantastic support in putting this course together. Also the um, Monash University for supporting the course, course and also the great production team that we've had in producing these videos as well. So finally, we're not going to be here, but you can continue on with the course if you haven't quite finished and enjoy hopefully some of the um, aspects of it that you haven't quite got done yet. There's still plenty of time. It will still remain open. And if you have enjoyed the course, please tell all your friends and family about it and send them to the Food is Medicine page on the FutureLearn website. And if the course dates aren't up for next year just yet, they can still register their interest and receive an email when we have those dates finalised for you in the early year. So thank you once again. I've enjoyed speaking with you all um, and enjoyed reading all your comments and um, looking at you all chatting to each other and offering ideas and um, helpful advice and we look forward to seeing you beginning of next year. And with some new exciting developments yes. too as we gradually, we're, we're not going to stop working on this, mm. we'll be working on some new ideas and we'll be in contact with you about those via email. So you'll be hearing from us soon. So in the meantime, goodbye from us. Thanks everyone. <laughs>